Okay, we're live. Okay. All right, cool. I've shared it. I've put as much word out there as I can, and hopefully we'll, we'll have some folks jump in with some good questions. Oh, well. I think we will. I'm going to wait until I see an eyeball pop up. As soon as I see one person, then we'll get going. Oh, there's one person. Hey, everybody. Okay. This is Jason, Colorado Mountain Man Survival. Thanks for joining us. I've got Kirsten with Survival Betty, um, also uh, Humble Bee Homestead and a few other projects you got going on. Um, for those that join in and don't know me, I'm the owner of Colorado Mountain Man Survival and the Survival University. Uh, I started my business roughly 2010. I think you were pretty close to the same time, weren't you? Yeah, 2012 is when I jumped online officially. All right. So um, what I do is I... Uh, I basically, for uh, you know, make this really short. I take people out and teach them wilderness survival skills. Do some wilderness skills. This is stuff that I learned growing up. So I've been doing this basically as a hobby or whatever you want to call it since I was uh, knee high to a gnat. But um, realized that survival and prepping and everything kind of was popular in about 2010. Realized I knew all the stuff that everybody wanted to learn. So I basically, uh, as a side job for several years, uh, started helping people with consulting, prepping, bug out bags, survival kits, and it just escalated into what I do now, taking people out and into the woods um, and teaching them wilderness skills and everything else associated with it. But it does relate to uh, real life situations, you know, prepping, survival, adventuring, whatever it is you like to do, what I do probably will touch your life at some point. Anyways, uh, with the, the coronavirus, COVID-19, whatever you want to call it right now, you know, a lot of us that are in this field of work teaching people about whatever it is we do, you know, we're not able to get out there to teach people these skills. So I started this webinar and bringing in instructors from all over the country to try to bring you information uh, on how to you know, deal with the situation now and how to continue your training and your preps or whatever you want to call it. But this week I brought in Kirsten to talk about um, gardening and herbalism and homesteading. And uh, I won't, I'll let you talk about yourself. Uh, but yeah, hopefully we'll probably be here for maybe an hour, an hour and a half. If you have any questions, be sure to ask them. We'll answer them as they come up. Um, if you are not, sorry, if you are not on my Facebook page for CMM Survival or you are not watching from YouTube, if you ask a question in whatever group that you're in, because I've shared this all over the place, um, if you ask a question in the chat from there, I will not see it. You will have to come to my Facebook page. That's just uh, Facebook slash CMM Survival. You ask a question there, then I'll be able to see it and I'll be able to answer your questions or at least we'll be able to try. But uh, I'm done talking for now. I can keep going, but I'll turn it over to Kristen. You want to go ahead and introduce yourself. That'd be awesome. Yeah. So I'm Kirsten from Survival Betty and I started that page actually just as a Facebook page on 2012. It was shortly after I had attendance of training on a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, which is here in the Pacific Northwest, a really major mega earthquake that could happen. It's actually not could happen. It's going to happen at some point. It's just when we don't really know naturally. So I started thinking about what my preparedness level would be and how I was going to the grocery store every week and how that was not feasible. And living on 50 acres, why wasn't I doing something more with that? So I started Survival Betty as a way to kind of document what I was doing. I already had all these homesteading skills that I had grown up with. Um, I knew how to can food and I'd always had a garden. And I just kind of grew up with these traditional skills that people find um, old fashioned now, but they were just a normal part of my life. So I found that the more I started posting about these things that I was doing in an attempt to be more prepared and to live more self-reliant and to make sure I had a better quality of life through these traditional skills, people really enjoyed it and resonated with them and they wanted to learn or they wanted to share their own experiences because I really truly believe that 
I'm learning as much every day from the people on my pages as I'm trying to give out as well. It seems to be a very um, collaborative project, if you will. And uh, it's just stuck and it's evolved into something like Apothebox, which is a, another business that I started as a direct result of, um, I had kids in 2015, I had twins and they're almost five now. And we were out foraging and I was looking for ways to make sure to take these traditional skills that I had been given and pass them on to my kids. And I started giving the elderberry syrup and, and echinacea glycerites and all these extra things to the kids. And we were foraging and learning about the plants on the land. And um, I noticed that people wanted to learn it as well. And they wanted to learn it in a way that was one plant at a time, was very easy to digest, be given the materials all at once that they could take that material into their home, do their project together, and voila, they'd have a tincture or a salve. So Survival Betty started as emergency preparedness, and it's kind of gone in a variety of other ways, also starting an elderberry farm. And, uh, you know, just trying to live a self-reliant right life as much as I can for myself and, and my family. That's really me in a nutshell. Uh, you Did you say where you're, where you're from? Yeah, no, I don't think I did. So I'm in the Willamette Valley region of Oregon. It's the Pacific Northwest, obviously, where I live in a valley. It's got this great alluvial soil that's a result of several glacier incidents millions of years ago. It deposited all this rich soil into this bottom land where I live. And um, it's got a nice mild climate. So I'm able to garden four seasons and grow a wide variety of amazing things without being a tropical climate. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where we live. Where and I that? live on the homestead that my grandparents started uh, in the early 70s. They moved out here from California. Like, like all natural Oregonians, I'm from California. So <laughs> I'm a valley girl. From Orange County down to now uh, Oregon, but it's uh, been my great grandfather that lived here, my grandparents, my parents, myself, and now my kids. So it's really been a homestead that ha has really kind of been a real center in my childhood as well. Awesome. So we might have some different gardening techniques since you're in a nice, uh, growing, rich environment, and Colorado is way uh, more unforgiving i think is that the right way to put it but uh we'll have some different techniques i might talk about some of them i'm not a huge gardener but i do have a garden um some years it's been successful some it's not but i've really been getting into it a lot lately i have a friend that's been helping me out with uh um the mulching you know having mulch on the top of the soil that really helps compost and keep the water in because we we're in such a dry arid environment so i'll talk about that probably a little bit today to help for people that are in more uh, my type of environment but do you want to start with talking about gardening or do you want to talk about herbalism or what's your well let's let's start with gardening i was going to send you some slides and i apologize i didn't get time for that but you know uh gardening has hit a huge spur in in uh, popularity obviously just like chickens have apparently it's chickens are the new toilet paper i guess where <laughs> chickens were selling out i i called the the farm store one day and i said should you get new chicks in i I'd, I'd already gotten my chicks but i wanted to test the waters and they said no they sold out in like 30 minutes you know or three hours then the next time i called back they said they sold out in 30 minutes and so they can't keep those things in stock so Gardening is right there. You can hardly get seeds. If you had a seed order in, um, if you didn't already have them in the hand shortly after all this started, you might still be waiting for your seeds. So yep. a lot of us are using seeds that are whatever we could find may not be the, um, you know, some of my favorite brands are Baker Creek seed and territorial seed or victory seed. Those are all other than Baker Creek, the other two are local to me. Um, but I just had to use kind of a lot of old seeds that I had on hand or things that um, I was able to get at the last minute. You're just going to use what you have. So other being local to you, why do you choose those seeds? Um, I like them local, not just because it's good for the economy, but they also produce, um, I, I hate to say non-GMO seeds because GMO seeds, there's there's only like 11 actual GMO seeds and uh, they're not our typical garden variety. That doesn't mean that they're not 
that there couldn't be heirloom or non heirloom. But I like those companies because they all they all have a seed saver pack, a promise to be non GMO if it ever does go that way. Um, and uh, I like the fact that those plants that they're growing are acclimatized or acclimated to our climate. Thank right. you. And so they work a little bit better. I know that they've been trialed and tested and do well in my environment. Let's just start there. So if you're in Colorado or you're in Maine, you might want to consider a seed company that is in your climate because they're going to trial those seeds. They're going to have them for several seasons in their field. They're going to be hardy for your environment. So I really recommend those local companies just mainly for that reason. Awesome. Good, good advice. Okay. We got a question that already come in. Uh, Brian's wife's been, or Brian has been trying to walk, talk his wife into chickens. She's worried they will destroy the garden. What are your thoughts on that? They will destroy your garden. So you will want to make sure to either garden in a raised bed or keep them in their, their chicken run when you're planting all your seedlings. I let my chickens just have at the garden in the fall and through the winter. And then once I start prepping in the spring, they're kicked out of the garden. I don't, I have a really big garden, so I can't easily fence mine. Um, so I just kick them out and keep them in a, in their big run. They have a really big run and that's what I would recommend doing. Yeah. Yeah. So we had uh, chickens up until uh, last fall. Um, but a raccoon just decided to come in and decimate our population. But instead of fencing the, well, we have one garden bed that is completely fenced in, but the chickens had a, a big coop that they could stay in. So we actually fenced the chickens in an area. Um, so that might be an, the best option for some people, especially if you're doing backyard gardening, backyard homesteading where your chickens and your gardens or whatever your garden is in just a small area, which is what I do. You know, I, I do live in the city. I'm not always running around in the mountains in a cave, but um, <laughs> the city I have, you know, I have a good sized garden plot and then a sectioned off area just for my chickens to keep them contained. Uh, during sometimes during the day, I'll let them out and they'll go roam around the yard and go roam around the garden under supervision so that they can go eat bugs and insects and dig up the ground and uh, help fertilize. That's a good plan. One of my little tips and tricks that I like with the chickens when I feel like they're getting coop fever is I'll let them out just about 30 minutes before sundown because chickens have notoriously bad vision. So they like to get back into the coop before it's nighttime. So they'll forage around in that immediate area close to the coop and then they'll make for the hills when it's when it's nighttime. Good advice. All right. So back to gardening after the seeds. Uh, where, where, were we, where were we at? And just talking about getting the, you know, where were we at? That's that's when we're having a good conversation, when you lose your place in the talk. But it's easy to do when you're chatty Kathy like me. But um, when when you, it's been nice to see this resurgence in homesteading or in gardening and having chickens, things that our grandparents just did normal. They grew up during the depression. Um, maybe <laughs> my grandparents might be older than most people's, but but they did grow up during times when they valued victory gardens and they had chickens and they had a milk cow and that was just normal life for them. So I love seeing that people are interested back in, in, in putting these back in here or putting gardens back into their homes. One thing that I hope people consider is crops that grow in a short amount of time like beets and radish or consider growing microgreens like their broccoli seeds um, or the, even the radish make really nice microgreens, kale, all of those crops you can kind of cut and come again or use in more, more than one way, like harvesting beet tops while the beet is still growing. You don't cut the whole beet top off, but you take a couple leaves here and there and waiting for your beets to grow, you can have your beet tops, use them in a salad or saute them much like you would a Swiss chard. So I hope that folks are not just planting the corn and the tomatoes, but they're thinking about crops that they can use in multiple times, plant in multiple places throughout the season, carrots several times and beets several times, get the kale in, the Swiss chard that you can cut and come again. Those are all really great crops. And runner beans, I don't even think I've hit on that yet. Runner, runner beans are a favorite of mine because they grow straight up the pole or along a fence line and you can harvest them when they're young to eat them as a green bean or you can leave them and le let them dry on the vine and shell them and add them to soups and stews once they're dried. It's a great plant to have in your garden as well. So I hope folks are kind of diversifying their crops. 
What's your what would you suggest for cold weather crops? Or the first first uh, plants to to plant? Yeah, the cruciferous vegetables are great. So get your kales, your broccolis, your cauliflower, your cabbage going, get your peas planted early. You can usually plant peas early before the last frost date. I already, like we talked about earlier, I was getting mine in the ground as well. So get those things planted early and be prepared to plant them often. In my climate, I plant kale once and it lasts me the whole year until spring. It'll start to bolt. It's bolting right now. And I'm already got my second crop of kale coming on. So yeah, you're you're a little step ahead of me, but we're still snowing out here, and it's you know getting cold, or it's still cold at night. So we're we're still everybody in our region is still just put, starting with their seedlings, their sprouts inside. At least that's what I'm doing. But um, good, yeah, I think that's uh, be nice to actually get everything outside. But I think we got a couple more weeks out here. When is do you know when your average last frost date is? No. Yeah, you probably have a few more weeks to go. So I remember Colorado. I've been there several times and it it was it was awesome because it was so beautiful. I never seen mountains like that. Um, but it was very cold. Yeah. Yeah. We just have long winters. I mean, I don't think we have horrible winters like we out, out east or further up north. Our winters are just long. I think we have like two weeks of summer. <laughs> and that's about it but no a little exaggerated but yeah just yeah. long winter so you just really have to take advantage of our growing season out here and as soon as um i don't know i'm probably about it's probably about two two weeks too late with pl planting the seedlings inside and i think i started those two weeks ago so i probably should have started them about a month ago out here um and then um Probably, I would say what is probably middle of next month, I think, is probably the best time for us to start moving things outside at least a little bit at a time just so that they can get a little toughened up a little bit. But uh, I do have I have a small greenhouse. We're going to put stuff in that greenhouse. I do have Good. kind of sort of not exactly a raised bed, but it's a little raised bed, but it's probably about 10 by 12 uh, garden box that we're going to this year we're going to put a canopy over it because two years ago we lost the whole thing to hail because um, uh, we got it out there too early. Um, but we're going to put a canopy over it with uh, like um, gardening plastic with that mesh in it. So if you're yeah. in Colorado, beware of the hail for sure. You're going to want to put some sort of protection over it, uh, especially, uh, well, y'all, if you're from Colorado, you're kind of familiar with our, our horrible hail, but make sure you're protecting your garden. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's good advice everywhere, actually, because Mother Nature has her own plans. You can get your crop in and, and it'll all go south with too much rain. That's something that we have as well. We'll absolutely get flooded out. Um, so depending on where you are, Mother Nature, she doesn't care if you have to eat or not. <laughs> right. That's for sure. <laughs> she's, she's got a wicked sense of humor. Yeah. So what, what do you use for your fertilizer for your garden or if anything at this point? I use, well, I'm a big fan of mulching. So I, I got so happy to hear that you're mulching everything down. So I use mint compost, which is in, here in Oregon, we grow a lot of peppermint. And when they distill out those volatile oils from the peppermint, they basically put it in a big truck bin that looks like a garbage truck. And we pull it up the distillery, they hook it up to steam and they cook it for several hours to distill out those volatile oils. What you're left with is this chopped up straw that smells really nice and is full of great minerals and all kinds of good nutri nutrients for your plants. That always gets put down in mass all over my garden. And then I put down um, grass clippings lightly over the top to suppress the weeds. And then when it comes to fertilization, I really am a huge fan of comfrey tea and fish emulsion. And I like foliar spraying. I just go in there with my sprayer that's just designed for fertilizing and hit all the plants until they start to set flower and then i stop awesome yeah i mean out here um a lot of people are doing for mulch is just using um tree uh mulched up tree chipped up tree bark stuff like that and yeah. spreading it over top of their soil really for us it's more to retain 
the moisture. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the, with our arid dry climate, we just want to keep that water in the ground. So basically we're putting that mulch over top and just letting it sit and it's composting itself. So over the years, you're just slowly adding a little bit more uh, compost and mulch to the top of it to keep your soil rich. But I also do a compost uh, compost pile. I'm sure you do the same. Mm -hmm. so everything that comes out of my kitchen that I don't eat, food remnants, um, coffee filters, coffee grounds, egg, uh, mm -hmm. egg shells, everything like that that goes right into this mulch pile, uh, compost pile in the backyard. And I just keep adding to it, adding to it, leaves, grass clippings, you name it, any sort of organic material goes in there and it just keeps stirring it up and adding water to it as I need it. And eventually it'll break down into very good topsoil. It's, and it's free more or less. I mean, you're going to throw that, that food away in any, anyway. So you might as well too, turn it into a compost pile. And right. right. In, what 40 or 50 or more dollars per yard of, of soil from a, from a soil company, which can be quite expensive. And if you don't put those wood mulch on top of it or something to retain it, it just it deteriorates over time. So if you're using that mulch, just keeps it going. Keeps Good it way to going. keep the moisture in. Yeah, oh yeah, it works great. Otherwise you're watering your uh, garden every day out here because it's so arid, so dry. Right. So I, I keep walking over you. <laughs> no, no, okay. I, I, it's John, all right. Jonathan's one of my friends from Colorado. He, he says the uh, average last day of frost here in Colorado is, is May 15th. So I, I roughly guesstimated it close, but that's if you're in Colorado and you're looking for the last day of frost, it's about May 15th. Thanks, John. Right. Yeah. So you do have a short growing season. We do. Yeah. Yep. But you've got a lot of sh short growing vegetables that you can fit in. There's lots of spinach and kales and shards and short season broccolis and short season tomatoes even. There's a lot of great things that you can still tuck into a garden, whether you're in Alaska or you're down here or you're Texas, Colorado. Yeah, it's good stuff. I mean, you just got to figure out what works for your environment. And I think throughout this summer, I'm going to try to document how I'm doing my garden. So anybody that follows me, is able to see what's going on. You can see my trials and trial and errors, but they say I'm not a master gardener or whatever you want to call it. Um, I just dabble in it. I've got a little bit of a green thumb, but I wouldn't say it's great, but uh, we'll see how things go. And you can critique you know it. If you see my pictures and be like, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> no, no. You know, that's the thing with gardening. It, it's kind of this great equalizer. So you can be a master gardener and just have nature, like I talked about, decide to destroy everything no matter what. I mean, gardening is one of those things that is a constant, I think learning any skill is a constant test of what you know and how resourceful you are and how tenacious you are because you don't want to just throw your hands in the air and say, I, I quit because your tomatoes didn't take that year because it could last year we had a terrible tomato season all throughout the Pacific Northwest. And so it wasn't just me, thankfully, but I, if I hadn't have been interconnected, I probably would have thought I just cannot ever grow tomatoes. It was just one of those bad years. Do you so, know what causes say a bad year for tomatoes? With us, it was too much water. It was just too much rain. So, you know, we can supplement with water, but when Mother Nature is bringing it on, it, if we just have a cold, wet spring, it can be really hard for those heat-loving crops to take root. So tomatoes did terrible. Peppers did terrible. Um, I tried to root them up and put my peppers in the greenhouse, and that was a failure. Um, it was just a lot of learning this last year that I was just forced to try some new things. I grew tomatoes for the first year in my greenhouse. That was a success. But you just don't ever know. You have to be tenacious when you're gardening and just just keep trying. Cool. Another question. What are some good short-term growing vegetables? I think you kind of touched on it, but and she's uh, Teresa's moving to Alaska and growing in a greenhouse. Do you have any advice to that? Yeah. Look at look at your short short season beans. Look at um your radishes, your anything that's a 30 day crop, get your kales on, get your broccolis going. Those things are going to be 30 to 60 days. Um, your root vegetables. If you're going to be growing in a greenhouse in Alaska, it might be beneficial to get those beds raised up a little bit in Alaska and not like for myself, I'm 
growing my tomatoes in the ground in the greenhouse, um, uh, you might benefit a little bit more from having a raised bed to provide some heat to the roots um, instead of just the ground. But yeah, that's exciting. Does she need to self pollinate in a greenhouse? If it's going to be cold and you're going to have it shut up the entire time, you're going to have to hand pollinate. So get yourself a couple small paint brushes and take those with you or swing by the art store on your way up to Alaska. Throw those in your gardening kit because you're going to want to be painting on pollen here and there. Or when it's really warm, just open up the greenhouse. I do that in the wintertime. I plant borage inside the greenhouse because the bees love it. And uh, I just open up the greenhouse. They come in, they hit the tomatoes, and it's good. Okay, another question. Everybody's is good. I like all the questions. It makes things go really well. Uh, so I learned in Iowa that I had to alternate corn and soybeans every year in the field. Are there other crops we should be aware of to do the same? Yeah, I think if you look up crop rotation for your gardens, there are going to be some plants you won't want to plant next to each other or you won't, you know, look at companion planting. Um, there are some you don't want to plant together. You can always put tomatoes and, and onions and um, peppers together, but you don't want to plant um, your cruciferous right next to your tomatoes. So you want to you want to do a little bit of research based upon what you're going to be planting. And I like to move things around. I don't do it every single year. Some gardeners will rotate their their little crops consistently. I don't. I do it about every two years or so. There you go. Companion planting. I think that's, is that it? Yep, companion planting chart. So that's going to be your best friend. You want to print that out, write in what vegetables you've got, and map them out in your garden and start planning a rotation. Some will do it every year. Some will do it like me. I'm probably the most lazy gardener. If there is a shortcut in the gardening and farming world, I pr probably know what it is. <clears throat> is it still working? I can't see or hear anyone. Can you, can you hear me? There we go. There you right. are. Yeah, no, you're good. I, I was just talking. So I took that. I was took myself out of the, out of the, I got panicked. I thought I was all alone. No, yeah. We heard you the entire time. It was all on my end, but I took the link <laughs> that I found for this complaint, this chart. There was a bunch of them out there. Um, but I put that in the chat here. So if you um, click on that link, you'll be able to see what I'm looking at here. But again, there's a ton of them out there. And I'm going to get rid of this. Okay. I got another question here. Um, do you have any advice for beginner gardeners to troubleshoot plant issues? Too much water, too little water, fungus rot, blight, et cetera. Yeah, you're gonna probably experience them all, I'm sorry to say. But what I would do is find out who your local extension office is through the university because their master gardener program has lots of volunteers that are really happy to have you email them pictures and um, find out what, I'm sorry, find out what, uh, what is going on with your plants? If it's a blossom end rot, if it's an issue with magnesium, if it's an issue with watering, they're going to be able to help you with that first and foremost. And get a good gardening book. A lot of the pests and diseases and problems that you're going to have with your crops are all going to be in gardening books. Do you have any suggestions for books? Um, off the top of my head, I don't uh, because I'm terrible with names, <laughs> but I would be happy to put them in the comments here in a little bit. I have a couple trusty little garden manuals that I love. Right on. That'd be awesome. I think that'd be very helpful for, for everybody else. Not me. Yeah. Probably very much. So me, uh, yeah. I'm about to see my, my UPS guy creeping in my backyard oh, here in a second. Right. I don't know why he parked there. That's what caught my attention. So he's, he's now tromping through the yard, wondering where he's going and I can't help him. I'm busy. <laughs> That's funny. All right. <laughs> so, um, what else have we got about gardening? Um, Watering systems. What are you using for a watering system? What am I using? Yeah. Uh, I don't have anything special. What I, I'm going to do is hopefully the, the mulch um, will keep it so I don't have to water as much. Otherwise, I just have uh, a hose attached to the side of my house that I'm going to go out and water with every once in a while. Um, mm -hmm. I've thought about doing rain barrels, but that's not into play yet. Right, right. right. What do you do? 
You know, I usually use soaker hoses because the garden's pretty big. And then I just rotate them on zones and do it like that. This last year, I was in a panic and unable to get my soaker hoses down in time. And I had to use broadcast sprinklers. And uh, I had actually gone to an elderberry growers conference back in Missouri. So I had to leave my mom in charge of the farm and she didn't pull any weeds and she just used that broadcast sprinkler. And I grew some pretty amazing weeds that year that I'm still recovering from this spring in the garden. So I'll go back to the soaker hoses just because it's a less of an investment for me than a drip system. But this next year I'll be installing a drip system into the elderberry orchard and I'll be using that in the garden as well. Can you explain soaker hose? What is that? A soaker hose is just like a regular hose, but it's it's perforated. It basically will just ooze, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. ooze water and uh, just slowly drip out into the garden. And I'll cover that up with mulch so that way it keeps everything nice and wet. And I only have to use a soaker hose maybe once a week, uh, just depending. August are our hottest month, so I might jump it up to twice a week. But it's a lot easier. But however, it uses more water than a drip system. And I'm on a well, so I would really like to be a little bit more economical with my water use and eventually move to a drip system and make that investment. And drip system, I can move the emitters. So I'm moving the emitters, just putting it where the plants are instead of watering a whole row. Okay. Uh, do you want to do anything with hydroponics? I would love to do aquaponics. Um, hydroponics are really cool too, if you've got this the space or the drive or the interest in that. But um, aquaponics is something I would be really interested in. Um, I have a koi pond, so I'm kind of jonesing out a little bit on fish anyways. So I think it would be kind of cool. But I just, I just don't have time right now to do it. But I admire those folks that do. Yeah, I've not really looked too much into the hydroponics. I mean, I think I've gone to some of the shows, um, some of the prepper shows or events, whatever you want to call them, that have had hydroponic setups, and they look pretty cool. But yeah. it looks like it could be a lot of work. So I'm not really. I'm like you. I'm a, I'm a lazy gardener. <laughs> I think once you get this set up, though, it's it's pretty easy. But I don't know anything about it, honestly. Right. Right. It looks like there might be a pretty good investment in the upfront, and that's something that's a little bit prohibitive to me in the beginning, right. is to get those those totes and the, all the materials to do it. Yeah, something I don't really want to do. I mean, dirt is expensive as enough as it is, but <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. And I can just throw the kids out in the garden with their little shovels, and they can weed and have fun. Uh, if I have it up, elevated in aquaponics, that's just I will lose my child labor. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So what else do we got? Um, besides your watering system, um, I have, yeah. but I can't think of what it was. So we hit on watering, fertilizing, stay on those weeds because the second you ease up, it's going to get crazy. Your weed pressure will just blossom overnight. Nothing grows like weeds. So just stay on it. Try to only put the water where the plants are. Don't water the weeds and stay on it. And if you don't till, if you don't continually turn over your soil, eventually all those seeds that are already in your soil are going to stay suppressed. When you start to till all the time, you're always bringing these seeds up to the surface and you're getting more and more weeds. But if you stop doing that and you just mulch real good and make sure you put your garden to bed at the end of the year, basically with a nice heavy layer of mulch or a cover crop, you're going to suppress those weeds more and more each year. First year is going to look different than the second, then the third year. You're going to start to see less and less weed pressure. So stay on the weeds. Pull them by hand, just put in the work, and you'll be thankful for it later down the road. You'll have a real nice, well-groomed garden. Have you seen gardens done in straw bales? Yeah, I actually did it. I was super excited and wanted to try straw bale gardening. Um, out where I was at, um, I live, like I said, in about 50 acres. And part of that field, that 38 acres, is leased to a farm. And... Uh, it seems like there's a lot of field mice as a result. So I had an amazing bumper crop of field mice in all my straw bales <laughs> that year. And it was horrendous. So for me, it didn't work. My mom is doing them though this year. She's um, 
way out in the sticks in Idaho and she's going to give it a try. So maybe for her, she'll have a different experience. Some people love them. You'll definitely want to fertilize with them if you're going to do that. They hold moisture really well, um, but you're going to want to supplement with some fish emulsion, give them some extra nutrients. Have you, do you do potatoes in straw or anything like that? That was another fun one. I actually posted on that because they say, well, you just lift up the wire cage and out will spill all these amazing tomatoes. And yeah, they did. And they were all half eaten. And there was a bunch of fat little mice in there as well. There were so many. They, thank God that I don't scare easy. They went everywhere the mice and the tomatoes and they were so fat they weren't even moving fast it was it was horrendous for me it was an absolute fail so I went back to using dirt but they looked great I have them on my Facebook page I wish I would have shared them but they look beautiful and the mice loved them so if you can keep the mice under control it probably work, work all right huh yeah, I, I love the idea of hilling up potatoes. I think that's the easiest way to do it is as the plant grows, you hill the soil up around them. It makes it easier to dig them out. So you get a little bit of a larger crop. The thing that I found worked best for me because I live near a dairy was I went and got composted cow manure and I just heaped on the cow manure because potatoes, love they're heavy feeders and they love it. And they just, I had gangbusters. And mice apparently... I don't like cow poo so much. So I had a much better crop. Right on. Um, so since we're talking about mice, do you have some natural options for pesticides? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm also a beekeeper. So everybody will throw out uh, the diatomaceous earth, which is a really great alternative. It kind of attacks the soft body of um, those little pests and kills them that way. But it also hits our pollinators and all of our little bees and butterflies and all those things as well. It's kind of an indiscriminatory natural pesticide, if you will, or um, something to get rid of the pests. But uh, I switched from that to using organic pyrethrum, which is made from chrysanthemums. And it works great. What I do is I mix it up, I go in early in the morning, and blast any plants that I might be having problems with Japanese beetles. Those are the ones that I have the biggest problem with. And I blast those plants where they might be hitting the tops and the underside of the leaves. And then I go back in the evening. Again, pollinators are not out early in the morning. They're not out late at night or at dusk. So I go back in at dusk and I hit them again with the, with the organic pyrethrum. And that really helps. I just try to use good companion plantings and I'll we'll be talking in a minute about one of my favorite herbs which is calendula which is also called pot marigold I put a ton of that in my garden and since I've been doing that I haven't had pest issues that I've had to spray for everything else has been pretty much balanced and taking care of itself is that what you're talking about this pyrethrum yeah uh-huh yep pyrethrum spreading awesome. and you can just you, you can pick it up at any of your home goods stores. We'll, we'll carry it. Okay. Well, I did throw a link in there about it. So if anybody wants to do a little bit of research on it and look things up, at least now you'll know how to spell it. I just kind of yeah. guessed. Uh, but all right. Um, yeah. We need a market for mice. Yes. I know. <laughs> I'm you, can start, you can start like a snake farm or something. I probably could. That's a good, I, I don't know. I got enough going on. I might pass on that one, but yeah, I could definitely start a market on mice. Have um, you ever heard about uh, what people that are doing um, like maggots or whatever? To, well, that's for chicken, feeding chickens. Never mind. Forget. I, uh, I read something about, we were talking about chickens earlier that people were taking their, their, um, meats from their kitchen stuff that they didn't eat that they didn't want to throw in their compost pile and they were putting it in basically a trash bin that had a, a hose system that came out of it and the flies would come and lay all the their eggs in these this trash bin and the maggots would crawl up out of it sounds really disgusting but it, all the maggots would fall out of this this basically maggot water system watering system if you will around where the chickens at and the chickens would eat they would feed on the maggots. That's how they would sustain them. Like that's disgusting, but hey, whatever, it works. Yeah, 
I think um, black soldier flies are really popular um, and mealworms. There's a lot of, I hear mealworms are kind of a bit of an investment to get into growing mm -hmm. or raising. Are you growing? Are you raising them? I don't know. But uh, they kind of are popular for chicken snacks. And so I know some folks will do that on the homestead. It's another great way to increase maybe some income into your home and also just add some, some diet diversity for the girls, if, especially if you're on a smaller lot and you have a thing where your neighbors don't want to see your chickens and you don't want to free range them. That's a good way of giving them some snacks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, since we're talking about chickens still, um, if you're in the city and you're raising chickens, you can't have a rooster. You can only have ten hens uh, here in Colorado Springs where I live. We can only have uh, 10 chickens um, in the city. So check your local regulations and make sure you're sticking to that. Otherwise, you'll probably have neighbors complaining and animal control crawling through your, your house or your backyard and giving you a ticket or whatever. Um, but also chicken uh, droppings, uh, I use them for fertilizer, but it is, uh, what do you call it, a hot fertilizer. So mm -hmm. you can't put that directly on your grass or your vegetables or whatever. You have to add it to your compost and let it break down. Mm -hmm. so, the great stuff to add to your compost pile, but don't use it directly on your garden or your. That's a really good point. Yeah, it's got a compost for a minimum of six months. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty pretty nasty stuff if you're just throwing <laughs> it on your vegetables. Yep, I muck out the coop twice a year, and that's that's what I do. I throw it right in the garden and let it compost down in the garden for one of those because it it is so good, but it's it is hot. You will fry your plants. You'll kill yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's good stuff to use and just make sure you add it to that compost first. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, so we were talking about herbalism too and I wanted to touch base on that. Should we transition over to that? Yeah, we can do that. Do you want me to bring up one of these uh, pictures that you sent me or do you want to? Sure. Yeah, my top three herbs that you should be planting in your garden. We already talked about one of them. So one of the one of my top three is calendula. It's so easy to grow. It's also referred to as pot marigold. It can be put, there we go. It can be put right all throughout your garden. It's a great pest deterrent. You can use it for a variety of medicinal purposes. It's so funny, you know, being an Oregonian, you're, you're from Colorado. When you say medicinal, people's mind always go to <laughs> marijuana. So it's, I catch myself now using terminology that I've used forever, but now it has this different connotation. But the, the calendula is a, is a wonderful plant ally. I used it solely to diaper my kids with as a salve for years. I use it in all my all-purpose balm. And um, it's I like to use the dried flowers in my teas. You can throw some of those bright yellow and orange flowers into your, not the whole flower head, but the petals. Throw those petals into salads as well or make compound butters with them. There's so many great uses for calendula from tinctures to salve making to infused oils to compresses it's a great plant it's so easy to grow and it really should be a staple in everybody's garden it'll self-seed every year or it's super easy to just broadcast um, in the early spring and walk away and it'll do its thing i um, mean grown from starts it's a perfect plant to have and it is a great companion in your garden to keep those pests down. So put lots of it out. Right now, herbal distributors, like was just looking at Mountain Rose Herbs, which is located here in my area. They're selling whole dried calendula flowers for $70 a pound. And it is the world's easiest plant to grow. So um Grow your calendula, even if you don't use it for herbalism, it's great in the garden and it's cute. It's a cute plant. So big fan of the calendula. The other plant that I really feel like people should have is chamomile. Before um, you on the chamomile, sorry, what, what is it that you use calendula for uh, as far as an herb again? So I'll use it for infusing in oils like olive oil or coconut oil, jojoba oil, and I'll make salves out of it, use it as a liniment for sore muscles. It's probably my go-to base in everything. I probably put calendula in 99% of every salve that I make because it is soothing to the skin. It's great for dry chap skin, for bug bites. If you've got an an owie or an itchy or some sort of trauma that's minor, 
doesn't require stitches, then calendula is a great thing to put on it. And it's good for upset tummies and for digestion. So I have it in a tincture form as well. And teas, I should say, I probably, I put it in teas as well. So dried petals will go in my teas or I'll use fresh petals in my salad. All the resin in that plant is got medicinal value. It's in the green portion of the flower head. So you always want to snip off the flower head and dry it. It's easy to dry on a screen in your garage or under an eave where it's shady. Give it a day or two to dry and then store it and it will store easily for two years. All right, cool. Sorry I interrupted you on that one. What was the next that you were going to go to chamomile? Yeah, chamomile. I love chamomile. I'm I'm a mom, obviously, so I like to keep chamomile in the garden. It's easy to grow. I like it for tea. Um, I like it for iced tea. The kids enjoy it as part of their nighttime. Um, if, if they're having a hard time going to bed, it's a nice, easy tea to give them. It's very safe. And um, I use it as a glycerite, which is a type of extraction. When we take an herb and we mix it with alcohol, that's a type of extraction, but we call it tincture because it's got the alcohol. Well, instead of using alcohol with the kids, because um, as a parent, you need that for yourself, you want to use glycerite. So you'll use a all vegetable glycerite and um, you'll extract the constituents from the chamomile into that. And that's one of my most favorite sleep tinctures is I'll add a little bit of that to my tea at night or to a sleep formula that I have, or I can give a little bit to the kids if um, they're having um, a cold or flu, I might add a little bit of that to their tea as well. And um, it's a easy, simple herb to grow and it's very useful. Also makes a nice salve to treat pink eye. Um, or just dry skin. It's very beneficial, very easy to use plant. Have you ever used this stuff? Is that pineapple weed? It looks that like pineapple pine weed. It is pineapple weed. Yeah, it grows everywhere. It's really good. You might think I'm weird, but it's really good in biscuits and scones. Really? Um, it it kind of, sorry, go ahead. But I've not done that. It's good. It kind of has a, I don't know. <sighs> a little bit of not pineapple taste to it, but it has just like a fresh taste to it. If you're a plant lover, it's kind of a nice way to use it, but uh, it'll pop up all over your garden likely. Um, and you can either just pull it out or you can still use it. It has, it still has medicinal uses as well. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we call it pineapple weed here, but I guess another name for it is a uh, wild chamomile, which is why I pulled it up. Mm -hmm. It's a mild sedative. Uh, but it's to me, a lot of people say they taste that a uh, little hint of pineapple. I think it's got a very perfumey taste to it, almost um, kind of pungent just for a split second. But it, I, I think it really tastes good. And we have it growing out at our camp uh, where I run classes. And it's usually one of the favorites of the students is that the, this pineapple weed. Would you say the taste is uh, similar? To the chamomile, do they taste the same when they're fresh? No, they don't. I, to me, they don't taste anything like each other. But um, I don't. I I think it's preference. Most people are probably familiar with the chamomile tea, and so they might not like the stronger scent or taste from the pineapple weed. But it's got all the same kind of medicinal values as well. And I like that it's the native. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we had a question. Um, do you ever have a problem with combat compacting and how do you deal with it? One's uh, garden soil. I'm assuming that that's what they refer to. Um, I like to have designated paths in my garden for stepping and designated garden beds. And that helps with compaction and making sure that I keep it composted down and, um, keeping that soil well taken care of throughout the year. And that's going to help with compaction and just don't step on it. That's going to be the biggest benefit. That's why raised beds tend to do so well. They drain well and there's no compaction in them. Cool. Have you ever done, uh, well, Teresa says she's done that pineapple weed with, with orange peel and it was good. I, I really like the flavor of pineapple weed, but mm -hmm. I guess it is, it's a, uh, uh, probably just a personal preference, but 
Um, was there anything yeah. else you wanted to say about chamomile? Um, well, I'm going to try Teresa's suggestion. So next time that pops up, I'm going to save a little bit and make a nice tea out of it with some orange. That sounds really good. Um, yarrow, again, yarrow you want to definitely keep. So I, my biggest suggestion with yarrow, it's so easy to grow. You probably, most people have it somewhere growing around their home naturally. Mine, it's not as, as much in the valley anymore because our, the valleys become so farmed and so agricultural that many farmers view yarrow as a weed. And uh, it's a great plant to have in the garden. I'll dry it and I'll use the leaves in a powdered form. I'll make a little, I always keep a little tin of powdered yarrow with me because it's great for, if I get a cut, putting a, that powder on there and it'll stop the bleeding. It's one of the greatest benefits of that plant. So if you're out and about um, in the world and you've got a minor cut and you see some yarrow, just make a quick poultice out of that and it's gonna stop that bleeding. It's great for fevers as well. So um, that with a little bit of elderflower, if you're dealing with a, a fever can make a nice tea. Um, you can also make, um, a compress out of it, throw it in the bathtub, have a nice bath as well. And it's a good plant to have when you're getting a fever. I didn't for the longest time ever give my kids any kind of over the counter medication. We're lucky we didn't really need it. Um, but when it came to fevers, I'm always a big proponent to sweat the small ones out and using that, that yarrow when needed to help move that fever along. Um, it's also great as a medicinal plant for salves and infused oil as well. So those three plants are kind of my, if I could only tell somebody to only grow three medicinal herbs, those are probably the ones I should say everybody should start with because they're easy to grow. They have multiple purposes. They're very friendly herbs. They shouldn't be scary to anybody. Um, and they're quite lovely to have in the garden and beneficial. I never thought about growing yarrow in the garden, actually. I, it grows wild out here in Colorado. It, it grows up at camp. Um, I've seen it walking around down here in Colorado Springs from time to time. It does have a very, to me, a very bitter taste, mm -hmm. which I don't find enjoyable. Uh, I've done teas with it for upset stomachs, and it does work. Um, I've absolutely used it for uh, uh, injuries out at camp. I always There's always at least one person that cuts themselves out at camp with a knife during training, and I try to get them to use the natural remedies just so they can see that it's out there. But, yeah, yarrow works great for uh, uh, forming, helping form blood clots and stopping bleeding. But what I'll, if it, the cut is bad enough, what I'll have them do is make that poultice out of the yarrow and then use um, usnea or old man's beard kind of as a, a bandage, if not mm -hmm. over top of it and apply some sap to that. So it makes kind of a natural bandage. We've done that before with that yarrow underneath and it works really, really well. But yeah, yarrow is a great thing. Um, to me, it's easily identifiable. Um, yes. A lot of people do struggle with it because it does, well, I don't see it, but well, kind of, you know, see it as uh, part of the carrot family. It's not part of the carrot family, but I guess you can kind of loosely see that the flowers kind of look the same. But yeah, um, learn how to identify yarrow. It, I 100% agree. Uh, great plant to learn. To learn and to use. Uh, yeah, you bring up a really good point though. One that should be emphasized is if you're gonna go wild crafting and we're gonna talk about my top three for wild crafting, you, if you're not experienced in, and you don't know what you're doing, it's best to take up a, a tour or go on a wild crafting event with the group and learn for sure. So you don't end up hurting yourself. Yeah, what I, I tell people in my classes, um, you're not gonna learn everything um, from even a single class, even if you go out with the best of the best for, for taking a wild edible classes. I do wild edible class. I have Cattail Bob Seabeck that comes out and do, does wild edibles. Just one class, you're not going to learn it. You're not going to remember it. Just in my small little area, I think in, in about, I don't know, maybe an hour time frame, I can throw 65 different plants at you. Guarantee you'll be lucky to walk away remembering two of those. So what I try to teach people is um, get yourself uh, a few books that are local to your area. So if you're in Colorado, get books that are local to Colorado. 
Um, don't go out and buy a book that's edible plants of the North American East or whatever, you know, this book does me little good in Colorado. It's a kind of advanced book. I mean, you'll see it everywhere. All sorts of instructors will be like, this is the best book out there. It's not. Uh, this is an advanced book. If you already know what you're doing, this is the pro kind of the book that you would really want to look for. Um, but the problem I don't like this book is like 80% of it, I don't know if you can see it, are hand drawings. You're not going to be able to identify a book with hand drawings or a, a book, uh, a plant with hand drawings. You need colored pictures. And only the center of this book has colored pictures. Um, uh, what I recommend is, I mean, I got a bunch of books behind me. I actually, when I started really getting into plants, is I bought as many books as I could find that were very local to my area. Um, I think it ended up being about five or six books. And I walked out and I would first plant that I saw that I felt um, was interesting that I wanted to learn. I sat down next to that plant. I spread all those books out and I found that plant or at least attempted to find that plant in every single book. And you have to make sure that 100 percent matches because there are a lot of lookalikes. Um, don't make the plant fit the book. Um, don't force it to be the plant that you want it to be. But as soon as I did find that plant. In that book, and I verified it was that plant, I'd sit there and read about it. I'd read everything about it. And and then once I was done with that, I'd set that book down, mark the page, and then go to the next book. So I would identify that same plant in as many different books as I possibly can. And then when I was done with that, I made notes and I drew that plant. By the time I was done, I'd probably sit there at that plant for at least an hour studying it. And then I tell people every time I walk by that plant, I'm like, hey, look, there's a yarrow. And this is what you do with it. And this is what you make with it. And blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, my God, I know you told me last time. I'm like, well, <laughs> I know I'm going to tell you next time, too. It's not for you. It's for me. It's so I can remember it. So if you really want to learn these plants, the wild plants, get your, some good books local to your area and go for a nature walk. And then go out with an expert and say, hey, I think this is Yarrow, am I right? And then have them confirm it with you. So good, such good advice. All right, sorry, I went on a tangent there. Uh, no, it's a good it's a good tangent because foraging or wild crafting is so popular right now and people have got to do it safely. Okay, so we got another t uh, question here, storage tips on herb crops, especially for maintaining potency. Any advice for that? Yeah, great question, Brian. Some herbs are going to store better. So like roots, for example, roots and mushrooms are going to store best if they're kept as whole as possible. And the same goes for really all medicinal herbs that when you start to grind them or chop them into powders or smaller pieces, they start to lose their potency over time. So if you can store whole fresh or sorry, whole dried herbs or roots and berries, that's best first. And you could get a year, two years, depending on how you store them. You want to store them anywhere around 65 degrees, low humidity, put them in glass jars, keep them out of light, and they're going to store for a long time. But I try not to keep any dried plant parts like flower tops, for example, those won't keep more than maybe 12 or 18 months in my house. I tend to cycle through them, but uh, roots and barks and herb, I'll keep a lot longer. Yeah. And I store them all the same way. They're all, these are, this is tea, but I store everything in glass jars just like this and they're labeled. So this is an example of how I would store all my herbs as well. Do you ever so, put anything in mylar bags? Um, not any of my herbs because I'm, I'm always continually trying to use them. Now food, I definitely do. Uh, long-term food storage, I will do that as well. And even some of my midterm food storage, something that I'm planning on using within six months will be in Mylar as well. I think I went to a local apothecary, I think that's what it is. Uh, they, a lot of their herbs that I saw in their back were in Mylar bags. That's why I asked that. Uh, for you, See, store, go ahead. When they might have been buying them from a distributor. So sometimes when they come from the farmers or to the distributor, they'll pack them in mylar bags and ship them out that way. 
Um, or maybe they've just found that's a really good way to, to store them. Just to, from the home apothecary perspective, I'll just store them in my glass jars. Do you, any difference between glass and plastic? I just prefer glass. You know, I think that uh, if, you, if you've got any concerns about plastic, you know, that might be a place where you would make that adjustment. If all you have is plastic, then just put it in a plastic bag. If that's what you got and that's your resource, then do it. I'd rather have people storing herbs in plastic than not messing with them at all. Right. Do you use stinging nettle at all? Yes. And now is a great time. Look how animated I got. I got so excited. <laughs> you're talking, it's, you're nerding me out, man. So yeah. Love nettle because you can harvest those nettle tops and you can saute them, cook them in a variety of ways or like fiddleheads. You can just do so much with them, but um, you can also dry them and use them as an infusion. It's really, it's considered what Susan Weed, the herbalist would call a nourishing herbal infusion. Yeah. I mean, that's probably one of my favorite plants, the wild edibles out here. Um, have you ever tried growing them in a garden? Yeah, I yeah, you know, when I grew up out here, so I have a brother that's four years older. So I have a childhood full of being terrorized. And one of the things that my brother did, because we have these woods next to our house, is he said, hey, I was like, maybe seven or eight. He said, hey, come on over here, run through these bushes with me. We're going to play army together. It's going to be fun. <laughs> well, he had me run through an entire batch of stinging nettle which was like the most miserable experience for a small child to run through head high nettle. But that patch is now gone. Probably my mom probably took a flamethrower to it when I wasn't looking, but I've had to reestablish nettle in some of the waterways out here. So yeah, I bought nettle plants from somebody who was dividing theirs. They're an herb farm and went and grabbed some and reestablished them out here. Yeah. I think I think stinging nettle is in the hemp family, which is why it does kind of somewhat resemble marijuana, I think, but mm -hmm. a great plant, the little, it's called stinging nettle if you've never dealt with it before. On the bottom side of those leaves and on the stalk, I can't really find a good picture here, but right on the bottom side of these leaves and on the stalk here, you probably might be able to see it here. There's little tiny hairs. Um, those little hairs or they're thorns have a little drop of, I guess, what, formic acid that's mm -hmm. in there. Is that correct? It sounds, it sounds right. All it's right. painful yeah. stuff. It does it, but it's not like poison ivy. It will get on no. your skin and it burns like hell, sometimes for 10 or 15 minutes, right. sometimes for a day or two, but it's, it's not as bad as um, poison ivy. It's just more of a Mild. It's a skin yeah, it sucks. Uh, sometimes it sucks really bad, but it will go away. Uh, but it, there's different ways you can harvest that. I mean, I always harvest it if I want to go harvest a lot of it with gloves on, and I'll just you know ethic uh, harvest ethically. Don't take everything from a wild area. I'll take there's 30 30 plants. I'll take maybe 10 of them, um, but. I'll run my hand with a glove, gloved hand down that stalk uh, and pull all those leaves off. And when I'm doing that, I'm breaking down those hairs and then uh, either put it in a cooking pot and boil it for about five minutes. And all it does is it's, it's releasing all the acids that's in that leaf or in the hairs and it makes it safe to eat them. And you can actually also drink the tea. And I like both, I like the flavor of both, both the tea and eating the leaves. Or like you said, you can dry them out and drying them out, the acid dries out. But if um, you're just picking them, if you're being very careful, you can pick just a leaf, one leaf out, off at a time and then break that. You roll that leaf in, uh, on your fingers in your hand. The, the skin on the palm of your hand and on your fingers is usually too tough for the needles to penetrate your skin. And you can break those needles down and then you can just eat it without even cooking it. But, Great tip. Uh, it's what is it? I think it's got a little bit of protein in it, but it really it's more of a a, a detox, right? Yeah, it's got a lot of vitamins and minerals in it, so it's a very nourishing for your nervous system and just overall health. If you're going to use it dried as a as an herbal infusion, 
what you'll basically do is you'll take a quart jar and you'll put in an ounce of dried herb. You'll fill it up with water and you'll just let it sit on the counter overnight. And then you want to strain it real good through a coffee filter to get those little needles out because they will irritate you. Um, and it is just a great way to boost your nervous system. If you're just feeling weathered and tired and over it, that's a great plant to have. It's just good for your body. It's a, one of the best ways to get vitamins and minerals into your system is through food sources. Jason, are you using the nettle for cordage at all? I do. Yes. Sorry. I was looking for one of the books that I use for uh, identifying um, medicinal properties, but I don't see it here. It must be up at camp, but yeah, absolutely. You can, you can use that. The, the basically the bark or the outer flesh of that long stem as cordage. It's not optimal. Um, it's not my my cordage of choice. I would much rather use yucca, but mm -hmm. in a pinch, it does make cordage. Uh, you just have to be a little bit more um, delicate about it at first until you get it processed down and you get multiple pieces. But yeah, it'll make a fairly st strong rope. Um, I could probably with a a piece of rope the size of air cord, you know, that big. If I can make a good strand of nettle cordage, that'll probably hold 50, 60, 70 pounds as long as I weave it together properly. It, it, it awesome. works pretty well. It's a versatile plant. It's definitely yeah. worth having. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I forget if there's a use for the roots. Do you do you know? I've never used it for the roots, no. I if can't. people are interested in herbal infusions, they should look up Susan Weed online. She's a real mm -hmm. big proponent of those mm -hmm. herbal infusions. Like um, she uses comfrey and uh, milky oats and nettle. Uh, comfrey is somewhat, people, people are controversial with that being ingested. What's her but name? Susan Weed. And she's, uh, she's an herbalist who uh, is really big on those nourishing herbal infusions. And she does a lot of nettle infusions. Is that her? That's her. All righty. So, yeah, if you're interested in checking out Susan Weed, I'll drop a link in the chat for you guys to check out. Cool. All right. Yeah. Any other herbs that you yep. or, uh so yeah, those are my top three plant allies for the home. So you should be, you should have those. If you can't wildcraft them, just grow them. If you're going to be wildcrafting, um, black elderberry is one of my top threes. If you're going to have kids right now, it's so, people are so familiar with elderberry now because of this COVID pandemic stuff. People are taking elderberry syrup like gangbusters to try to boost their immune system. And uh, you can forage for that that grows in every continent in the world with the exception of Antarctica. So you can find some species, some variation of, of an elderberry, black elderberry, I should say, the nigras growing somewhere. You've got them in Colorado, we've got them over here in Oregon, they grow in Maine, they're all over the place. Um, there's red elderberry and there's black elderberry and that's why I made the distinction with black elderberry is what I'm talking about using red elderberry for medicinal purposes is going to be way outside the scope of most beginner herbalists and they should stick to an easily identified plant such as black elderberry. Once they feel comfortable with it, they know it's an elder. It's a great plant because you can use it fresh for fruits and pies. You can make uh, immune boosting syrup out of it. The leaves can be decocted into a tincture um, and used for a variety of, of, um, you can use it to treat viruses. It's something that's kind of fringe and people are using right now for COVID. It's not fringe in the herbalism world. It just, the idea of decocted elderberry even terrifies elderberry growers when it, it shouldn't. Um, so it's easy to identify. It's multi-purpose. You can use it dried. You can use it fresh. The elderflower is, makes a wonderful elderflower cordial. Um, you can add it to drinks um, to change and enhance the flavor, make mocktails, if you will. Um, I like it dried in teas for fevers. It's a variety of great uses for this plant. It's not just immune boosting. It kind of goes beyond that. I did, um, before I knew the cough apocalypse was going to happen, um, I had tinctured my elderberry. And what I had done is I take my elderberry kit that I have at a pot the box, and I just dumped all the contents into a cart quart size jar. This was done December of 2019 and uh, dumped it all into a jar and 
added a bunch of hot water to it, boiling water, just enough to cover the herbs, just to moisten them, I guess, if you will, and let it cool to room temperature. And then I topped it off with brandy. That's probably my favorite um, um, alcohol to use for a lot of my tinctures. And um, we've been using this ever since COVID started. And I got a family of four and I'm just now starting to get down into here. So I like elderberry tincture instead of elderberry syrup because I can maximize my elder products. Um, but it's a great plant to have. Either forage it or you can grow it. It's easy to grow. I know we have uh, Rocky Mountain elderberry up at camp, which is a red elderberry. So it's mm -hmm. not, um, I've not really looked into it very much. Um, all I know is as it sits, it is toxic. So you can't um, mildly toxic. It gives you an upset stomach. I'm not sure if it's going to make you. It's not going to kill you if you eat it, if you don't eat too much of it. But, right, right. It's, uh, it's, it's got lectins in it and it's got some um, um, glycosides in it that can turn into um, cyanide. Uh, it's good to just, it has a higher amount of that than black elderberry. And I just tell people that aren't familiar with using it, just don't use it. I would prefer black elderberry or blue elderberry, which is what we have here in the Pacific Northwest, all down into Texas. Um, it, that's my preferred, those are my preferred elderberries to use. Yeah, which I mean, it's scary though, because you eat the fruit off of the, the red elderberry, the Rocky Mountain elderberry, and it's, it's good. It tastes good, but yeah. uh, it'll get you in trouble. Yeah. Yeah, those lectins can really hurt your stomach. They can cause a lot of stomach discomfort. So it's best to just avoid it. Yeah. So, oh, turkey tail. You, I bet you guys see that. It, you guys have a lot of actual mushrooms that grow out there in the woods. I bet you, you could probably write a book on the types of mushrooms that you've seen out there. Um, but turkey tail grows. <laughs> Turkey tail grows um, everywhere in the woods, and uh, you'll find it growing off telephone poles in some places or fence posts. Um, it's really easy to forage for. It's super easy to identify. Even its doppelganger is uh, won't hurt you if you ingest it, but you should identify it properly, and it's a polypore. And what that means is if you look on the underside of that mushroom, you'll see all these pinpoint holes in it that means that it's got many spores in it. So it's super easy to identify because it's got those polypores and um, it triamides versicolor is its name. It grows, it, it can be all brown. It can be different shades of brown. It can be kind of blue or gray. It has a lot of color variation in it. It's a great plant to have on hand. I use it in my teas sometimes at night to help boost my immune system. There, uh, Paul Stamets has got a lot of information on turkey tail and all kinds of fungus really about how it's being looked at for cancer treatment or as a preventative. That's why I take turkey tail mostly is to boost my immune system and as a, as a preventative. Um, and I just take a, a one or two of them and I throw them into my, my chai tea brew on the stove and I let it simmer for a little while. And I, that's how I have it. It's so easy to use, but you can do a double decoction because Parts of the plant are only water soluble. Parts of the plant um, also work well with alcohol as a solvent. So you kind of do a double decoction and, and you get a nice tincture out of it. But you can also just toss it into your to your tea and do a do a decoction that way. Love turkey tail. If you are interested in learning more about wild edibles, um, I do have a wild sorry not wild edibles but mushrooms. Um, I have uh, Mike Essam coming out and I think the first or second week in August of this oh. year. And Mike Essam is, uh, I think from the last I knew, he was the only guy in the state of Colorado certified by the state of Colorado to teach wild mushrooms. Whether is he's, that's the case still now or not, I don't know. But Mike is just phenomenal with wild mushrooms. But he turned me on to a book that I'm going to pull up here. I'll show you a great book. Um, let me type this in here. If you are looking to get going on um, learning how to identify plants, then check out this book. It's called All That the Rain Promises and More. Oh. Um, 
it's a very good book. I've gone through it. Um, very helpful with identifying mushrooms. Now, mushrooms can be pretty scary because you eat the wrong one and you're done pretty quick. But yep. if you're looking at if you're looking to get into mushrooms, check out this book. This is definitely something I would go out with an expert with or somebody that knows mushrooms very well to teach you about mushrooms. But the problem with mushrooms is there's so many lookalikes. It's easy to screw up. It's sometimes even the experts get it wrong. But yeah, yeah. Sometime in mid August, we're doing or early August, we're doing a class with Mushroom Mike or Mike Essam. So that book by David was my very first um, foraging book, basically. And it, I, my brother gave it to me, and I thought, "What is this? this? Is crazy!" And it is awesome. I'm so yeah. glad you threw that out there. Great book. Great book to have. It. It definitely helps with mushroom identification. Right. Right. Triomedes versicolor is one of those things that just has the one doppelganger and you'll know when you see it, it's got the, it's lacking the polypore. Um, but I can't say enough about go with somebody that is experienced because all mushrooms are edible at least once. So <laughs> you want to get all, right. All mushrooms are eatable. I don't know if they're edible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. You can you can ingest them, but it might be your last time. So I don't like to scare people away from foraging, but um, use common sense approaches for sure. And gosh, what a great opportunity to be able to take a class right there. Yeah, and Mike is very knowledgeable, and he's he's one of those people that um, when he doesn't know something, he's not going to bullshit you. He's just going to tell you. I don't know what that is. Don't eat it. <laughs> you know, I've only, yeah, I mean, no point in lying about something that's going to get you ultimately killed. Right, right, right. No, totally agree. So, yeah. And then my last one is Mullen. So, again, mom's story with Mullen. Uh, my son, every time he gets congested, he gets an earache. And he was about... I want to say he's about two or maybe three years old, just about three years old. And his sister, because they're twins, his sister said, my left ear hurts really, really bad. And she was complaining about it. So I said, all right, let's just go to the doctor. I don't have an otoscope to look in it. Let's just go into the doctor and see what they say. They look in her ears. Both of her ears look perfectly fine. So I said, maybe it's a weird twin thing. So look in his ears. And sure enough, he had an ear infection. And he just wasn't saying anything. So the eardrum was intact and she prescribed some antibiotics and some eardrops for him. And I went home and I knew from having nephews that were constantly having drains put in and ear issues that I wanted to go a different route than, than, um, than uh, antibiotics. And there's a time and a place for modern medicine. First of all, let me just say that, but maybe at the lower stages, there's, a time and a place to try other things. And I was still within that window to try some alternative methods. So I went ahead and, and had some mullein oil on hand and it had garlic in it and uh, mullein, it's got some calendula in it. And basically you just let it, let it sit and infuse for um, you know six months roughly. I think this was had been six months. I warmed it up and put a few drops in each of his ears several times a day. Went back to the doctor in a week and she went, wow, yeah, they, he responded nice to the antibiotics and the eardrops. And I went, yeah, but I didn't give him any of that. Didn't even fulfill the prescription. I just used, and it's called earache oil. And that's what I used instead. And um, I'm such a a huge fan of mullein because it's multi-purpose. It's great for respiratory problems. I have um, sports-induced asthma, so it's great for that. Or if I'm having smoke issues in the air, I'll have some mullein tea. Um, it's just a wonderful plant to have, super easy to identify, grows everywhere, and um, it's definitely worth having. I think Donnie Dust actually turned me on to the fact that Y'all use it in a survival setting sometimes for friction fires, which I had no idea. So I can't wait until I can head out that way and learn how to use it in that capacity. It's just an amazing, versatile plant. So big fan of it. Yeah, yeah. Since you're talking about it, uh, the what you use for the friction fire is um, the stalk, the center stalk. The, this is the second year growth, this plant that you see here. Uh, what... Mullen is a biannual plant, 
Mm -hmm. uh, so the first year that it grows, the only thing that comes up are these big leaves that you see at the bottom. It's not going to have this big, tall stalk that's standing up. Um, so the second year it comes up, it's got, it will come up with this big, long, tall stalk. Where the flowers are, these yellow flowers, when it dies at the end of the year, this whole stalk is a big, huge, rigid stick, basically. But up where the flowers are is it's the most dense, the driest, and the strongest piece. So what you're going to do is you're going to pull off the seeds and the, the, the pith area, or not the pith, but the, the holes from the seeds and get down to that center stalk. And that's going to be your hand drill. And uh, I wish I got some outside. I wish I'd have brought it in. But that's going to be the hand drill portion of it, that entire flower stalk area. And then you can also use the base of that stalk that's down near the ground as your fireboard. So in itself, this plant by itself, you can be able to start a fire with it with a hand drill. Now, a hand drill does take a lot of practice. Donnie mm -hmm. is phenomenal with a hand drill. I'll be honest, I'm way better than Don. Oh, wait, no. I'll be honest, I suck <laughs> at the hand drill. Nowhere near Donnie's skill level with a hand drill. Um, but I can show you how to do it. I'm just not good at it. My uh, my assistant, uh, call him Alaska Matt, he's pretty damn good with the hand drill. So, you know, if you ever want to come out to one of our classes, he can show you how to do it. But um, – oh. I am coming out and the yeah. kids are coming out. Yeah. This is, I, I carry my wazoo necklace because friction fires in me. Uh, uh, no, uh -huh. I, yeah, I mean, I can, I can crank out a bow drill, but boy, my, I, I guess I got soft, tender hands. So I have issues with the, with the, with the hand drill, but yeah, great plant. Um, I have used it. I really like the tea from it. I think I compare it to a mild green tea. Um, it's got yeah. a good flavor. Uh, yeah. The uh, flowers, since we're talking about the flowers are medicinal, right? Have you used the flowers for medicine? Yeah. When I, when I make my earache oil, I use garlic and calendula flowers and the flowers from the uh, mullein plant. You can use the leaves as well, but I prefer the flowers. Yeah. And this, but the seeds are poisonous. Um, they're, no, uh, don't eat the seeds. Yeah. Uh, are, there, are they a neurotoxin or is it, it, you know, that's a good question. I don't know that I've I've gotten much further past that. Um, I know for you can use it as a fish toxin. So if you have a small pool yes. of water and there's fish in it, what you do is it, it doesn't always work. But you can take the seeds and you grind up the seeds and you throw it in the water and it absorbs all the oxygen from the water and the fish can't breathe. So they'll float to the top. So you can use it sort of as, as a fish trap. Um, I've never not done it, um, but that's that's what I've heard it can be used for. But really, I, I, yeah, I've used the use the teas, and I think I've used I've used the flowers um, to make um, a tincture. I can't quite remember what I was using it for though. But if you're using it for eardrops, then there's one use for it. Yeah, it's it's I love plants that have more than one use and medicinal plants tend to have many, many different places and they can also encompass each other in various aspects and mullein is just so diverse and I think if you're going to be a, a parent it's a good idea to have around if you are at all um, like myself, where you um, are sensitive to smoke in the air, it's a good plant to have around. We had a massive amount of forest fires. All it felt like it was felt like the world was burning around me a while ago. And I live in a valley, so a valley, so all the smoke came in, and we we're just sitting. I couldn't even see my rental house that was a quarter mile away. The wow. smoke was so bad. So having something like mullein leaf on hand to make a tea out of is so soothing to your respiratory system. And also, the, there's dried leaves on the bottom. I don't. This picture here, you, I think there's, there's the brown leaves right in here where my mm -hmm. pointer is going. Yeah. You can actually smoke those also. So you burn those um, and, and inhale that smoke. And it sounds stupid, but the smoke from that will actually also help open up your bronchial tubes or whatever. It is. Yeah. So yeah. You look at a lot of. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a it's a base for a lot of smoking blends for herbs. Definitely. 
So yeah, good plan. It's funny because in Colorado, I don't know if it's the same where you're at, but they consider this a, a, a invasive weed. And they tell you if you see it, pull it. But it's such a good plan that I'm not going to do that. No, it. My my parents left to move to Idaho, and they built their house on the top of this mountain. And of course, having the track dozer and all the stuff up there, doing what it was doing was just pulling those seeds up from the ground. I mean, a mullein seed will live for. I think it's it's going to live longer than a cockroach. They they are the cockroach of seeds. Mullein will last forever. All it needs is a little bit of light to germinate, and it's go time. So they were having hundreds of mullen pop up and and my dad was like what is this i tried to spray it and i can't kill it i'm like yeah well you have respiratory problem you should be harvesting it <laughs> so i explained to him cut the flower stalks off when they appear don't allow it to flower and you'll never have to see it again and stop driving your track dozer for fun in your yard and you won't have any more problems um but it grows everywhere i purposely put it in my garden and you should see the farmer drive by the farmer drives by and they're pointing like what is that and oh it's a mole you gotta pull that out and then no just keep on driving you know <laughs> just keep on driving That's so funny. yeah it's they don't like it my dad hates it but it's a great plant to have he thinks i'm crazy but yeah it's good to have around forage for it grow it if you have to if you're going to grow it though pick those flowers off and then chop off that flowering top. Like you said, it'll send up side shoots that'll try to flower too, but just don't let it go to seed or you will have lots of mullen babies for decades to come. Yeah. Yeah. It does grow like crazy, but yeah, if you want to get into wild plants, whether they're medicinal or uh, edible or utilitarian, you make tools out of it or whatever, uh, there are so many plants out there you can use. You don't even realize how much stuff is out there until you start getting into it. And then you start realizing, you know, where this, where you saw one plant before, now you're getting right down in there and you realize that there's now 30 plants around that one plant that you, you recognize. And all of those plants have some sort of use, whether it's medicinal or edible. Uh, but it does take time and you do have to study it. It's But it's really kind of a, a fun hobby to start out with until you realize all the stuff that can be used, all these plants can be used for. But yeah, get yourself some good books and get busy. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? Do you have any other plants you want to talk about? Anybody have any questions? I am a plant geek. We could talk plants <laughs> from here until there's there's all oh, there's very little I know about, but I know plants and I know martial arts and defensive tactics. They could be no further apart on the spectrum, but those are my two worlds. So we can either talk fighting or we can talk growing. Yeah. That's all I know. Beat somebody with a plant. Uh, yeah. And sometimes fighting growing. It's, it's... <laughs> Do you want to talk about your apotha box? Um, yeah. You know, I, Apothobox grew so big so quick and I was so busy trying to be a mom that I had to kind of put parts of it on hold. So I still make my herbal teas and I still do small things on Apothobox for kits, but we're actually getting ready to relaunch our herbal learning kits, which um, we're going to keep super approachable one, one project at a time. For example, I might send you a kit to make your own elderberry syrup or might send you a kit to make your own dandelion tincture for digestive bitters. I might send you a kit to make an earache oil. It will depend kind of what herbs are around for what season. And it will come with the ingredients and the containers and a recipe card. It's a nice heavy cardstock recipe card that you can just stick in your herbal recipe box and refer to any time in the future. And so we'll be relaunching those hopefully soon. I just about have my orchard going. I've got two and a quarter acres of elderberries because I love plants. I'm putting in elderberries. So that's getting underway and I can refocus a little bit more on a pot the box. And it's a great way, like you said, learn one plant at a time. You don't get overwhelmed because there's a lot of information and one plant can lead to the next and it can feel overwhelming and it shouldn't for people. Just learn one plant at a time. Learn one basic. You learn to make one salve. 
you can make all the salves because you understand the process. You make one tincture, you can make all the tinctures. So it's just learning that process and it's trying to get people to use the plants. Don't just collect them in a cabinet. Let's use them. I'm trying to pull up your web page oh, here. So it's, it's myapothebox.com if you want to go and look at that and see what she's got going on. Yes, with thank that. you so much. Yeah. 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 It's really fun, super easy to do, and um, and it's such an easy, approachable way to learn herbs for folks interested in herbalism but just don't know where to start or they don't want to make a big investment into maybe an online course yet because they're not sure if they're going to like it at all. So yeah. it's an easy, approachable way. They yeah. are pretty cool. You sent me, I think you sent me the beginner kit with the calendula and the turkey tail and uh, something else in it. Yeah. And, and the different supplies to make salves and tinctures. And it was pretty awesome. And then I also got the mushroom one, which was really cool because it came in right before my class with uh, Mushroom Mike or Mike Essam. So that oh, that's right. and uh, handy. I think I got pictures out there at Mike's class with your box sitting in the background somewhere. But yeah, yeah. It, it's great stuff for for learning this stuff and to get you going and i don't know i thought it was really cool thank you yeah it's so much fun and i get asked a lot about what kind of Online. things do i put in um in to boost my immune system with covid going on and i'm really not doing anything too special with covid other than i'm making sure to get my elderberry and my echinacea tinctures and and but one of the things i'm doing more and more of has been to decoct those reishi mushrooms and the turkey tail and some chaga, finding ways to incorporate those fungus into my daily diet because they're amazing adaptogens to help you handle the stress and boost the immune system. And yeah, I hope that people that are watching this take your foraging class because just the, the power of medicinal mushrooms that is coming out. And I don't even mean the psychedelic ones that the folks love here in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> but I'll tell you about those too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, folks love those. Yeah. But, but, you know, the turkey tail, the reishi, the chaga, chaga doesn't grow here, I don't believe in my area. Um, but I think you guys probably have it. No chaga here either. But no chaga. Yeah. tends to be up further north. I know they have it some of the forests up in Washington and into Canada and Alaska. But those are such great adaptogens to help you handle stress, boost your immune system. And I can't say enough positive about about fungus. So I hope that people take advantage of that. Yeah, the, that uh, mushroom class that we had last year, I think we, we harvested um, probably about 40 pounds of, of edible mushrooms while we were out there. Yeah. So yeah, we had so many mushrooms, we damn near couldn't eat them all. But I had a picture out there a little bit ago, this, the, um, the, a King Belit, which was probably, oh. it was as big as my freaking chest. It was probably, you know, eight to 10 inches thick and, you know, two feet across. It was huge. Problem with it was, it was so old that it had been infested with, um, maggots and stuff like that. So we yeah. couldn't eat it, but we that was, that was not included in the other 40 pounds of mushrooms that we found to eat. Um, wow. I'll get a question here from Matt. Um, are there any herbs you carry with you for survival purposes? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yarrow first and foremost, because I can use that for uh, anything from not feeling well, having a small fever, upset stomach, um, to uh, stopping and using it for blood clotting and in minor injuries. So that's in my hiking bag, no matter what, first and foremost. The next one is going to be bitters. I usually have dandelion bitters with me because I have acid reflux. And so those bitters kind of help me with that. I'll always carry, I don't carry a lot of fresh plant material. Yarrow would be the only one that I, I will carry powdered. Everything else is going to be in a tincture form usually. And so I have a variety of a sleep tincture that I use that's got California poppy, hops, skullcap, um, valerian root in it trying to think what else is in there. Glycerites from chamomile and uh, lemon balm in it. So I'll carry all, those are usually always with me. Um, yeah, the, for survival, I guess daily living. I, I probably don't do anything that's specific survival related, I guess. I just try to live a very prepared life. Um, um, that's probably just 
it sure made incidents like this pandemic a lot easier to weather because I just lived this way. Yeah, I don't I don't really carry anything in my pack when I go out. Um, I probably should, but I typically uh, do carry uh, my med kit. I carry modern supplies, but when I'm out there, depending on the season, um, I try to find whatever's available fresh out in the natural environment to use. So um, if as little as I can carry on my back, the better, you know, I'm trying to conserve weight, conserve energy. So if I can just resort to finding the stuff out there as I need it, but like, you're not always going to be able to find it. So if you can carry a little bit of stuff, but you know, ounces turn into pounds. So, Oh yeah. Real quick. Yeah. Just a little tin of yarrow is all I ever take hiking. Well, not all I ever take all on the herb side because I so enjoyed your talk with Donnie the other day when you guys were talking about your wilderness survival kits, because it was a very validating for all the stuff I take hiking. Um, so those kind of supplies differ from what kind of herbs I would carry. The only herb that I would carry um, in an austere environment where I have to hike it in is going to be that yarrow powder. Just for the uh, blood clotting purposes or for? Yeah, just if I, just if I get a minor cut, that's, that's the only one. I'll just prefer to use that than stopping and putting a Band-Aid on. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you want to talk about your humble bee homestead real fast? Well, we're kind of doing something interesting with that. It's been humble bee homestead for years because I started raising bees out here as a beekeeper, but it's kind of evolved into more of a farm at this point. So um, it's really just kind of survival Betty's homestead. And um, the elder farm that we're doing is kind of turning into its own thing. My grandmother was Norwegian and Swedish. Her parents had immigrated to North Dakota. And so um, having grown up here and having a real strong connection to my Norwegian heritage, my Scandinavian heritage, we're actually changing it over to a company called Handwerk Farms. And Handwerk is for handmade in Norwegian because everything that I do is handmade out here. I've got willows. That's a hand harvested crop. I've got elders. That's it. Oh, I think I lost you. You still there? Let me see if I can get her back. I don't know if you can hear me or not, but we lost you. Trying to get her on Messenger here to see if she can, she sees it. If not, if she doesn't come back here in a minute or so, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Yeah, we lost connection. I'll give her a minute to see if we can, if she comes back on. Um, otherwise, we'll just see what happens. All right, guys. Well, I guess we'll call this uh, call it a night. Um, if you are interested in what Kirsten does, check out her website, um, but either the apothebox.com or humble bees. That's bees plural. Uh, humble bees homestead.com. Uh, another thing you can do, you can find her on Facebook under Survival Betty. That's what the, her original company was about ten years ago. Uh, hopefully, you enjoyed this with uh, me and Kirsten. Um, if you're interested in my classes, I'm on the survivaluniversity.com is my website. Have any questions about classes with me or anything going on with her, contact us and we'd be happy to answer any questions. If you are tuning into this um, in a rerun, go ahead and ask your questions and we'll come back to them at a, a later date and be able to uh, try to answer those for you. Um, somebody just asked, I do have a 50 day class. Uh, Brian, I'm not, are you signed up for that? 
Absolutely. We are still have the 50 day class. Uh, that starts July 5th, I believe, and runs until I think August 23rd. Oh, there's Kirsten. She's back. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. How good is that connection? You're, you're okay now. Yeah. Yeah. For now. So if you want to go you hear me, okay. Yeah, I can. Can you hear me? Must be a delay. Yeah, I can hear you. I'm logging back into my phone. Yeah, my phone just kicked me right off. <laughs> okay. Maybe you lost, lost, hit your data limit. Well, if you want to wrap things up, um, we can go ahead and, I mean, we've been on here for almost two hours. Can you believe that? Yeah, time flies when you're having fun. I told you I was chatty. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, go ahead. If I, are you, we left off at you talking about Willows. There's a little bit of a delay between us, but yeah, if you want to, I gave them your websites and I gave them your information if they want to contact you. Do you have any classes that you run at your homestead? Not yet. I've been so busy just trying to get it up and running. Um, it's something that is in the future, especially with, with the willows. People want to learn a little bit of basketry, a little bit of medicine making with the elders. Um, that's kind of tends to be the scope of things. And of course, for so many years, I was teaching defensive tactics. So I've just kind of taken a, a break to some degree from teaching. Um, you, I saw on your, your webpage, I lost it here. Where it's buried in one of my 900 different tabs. Um, you have a webinar coming up. Oh, that's our that's in the past, isn't it? It's already done. The growing elders. It it did, but I'm gonna be redoing a new one. So okay. yeah, if anybody's interested in growing elders, I'm gonna be re-recording that because the quality was so bad as we're experiencing with my feed right now. This is one of the dynamics of living out here. Um, so I'll be re-recording it and getting it up on YouTube. So I do have YouTube. I just haven't put any stuff up there yet. And this is going to be my first one as soon as it gets re-recorded. What's the best way for them to contact you? They can hit me up on Facebook. So facebook.com slash survival Betty, or they can always email me, uh, Betty at survival Betty. That's pretty easy to remember. And, uh, and I'll always get back. I'm happy to answer questions. If anybody wants to know whether tomatoes aren't growing or what peas to plant, you could just hit me up. I'm happy to help. I appreciate it, Kirsten. And um, I guess we'll wrap it up for the night. Uh, hopefully you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks everybody for joining me. Uh, again, the survivaluniversity.com is my website. Uh, Humble Bees Homestead is one of your websites uh, or just best place to get hit or is up on Facebook if you are on Facebook. But that's it for tonight. I Hopefully you enjoyed everything and that you learned something and uh, we'll put together something else here pretty soon. Again, thanks for joining me. Hope you all have a good night. Good night. Thank you.